so welcome to the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute. Uh, my name is Andrew Gustafson. I'll be giving the tutorial today, which will just be an introduction to the Supercomputing Institute. It will be kind of an overview of uh, what we do and how you can uh, engage with us and use our services. Uh, so just for reference, uh, our website is msi.umn.edu. And uh, all of our tutorial materials are available on our website. So the slides that you'll see today and also the video of of today or of recent uh, tutorials will be available here. So if you scroll down the website, there's this upcoming tutorials and events section. So this is today's tutorial. If you click on that, you'll see an overview of the tutorial. Uh, there's a previous recording. So if you want to watch a previous recording, you can watch it there. And there's tutorial materials. Tutorial materials will include the slides of the tutorial. So if you ever uh, want to see the slides associated with a particular tutorial, you can, you can go to the website and you can look at them there. You can find the list of all tutorials uh, if you start at the start at the beginning, and then if you go to help and documentation, and then tutorials, you'll see uh, the current tutorial, the featured tutorial. But then also down here, there's that you can see the full list of MSI tutorials, and you can scroll through all all the different tutorials that we've been giving recently, or uh, really over the last couple of years. You can click on any of them that seem interesting, and the slides and and usually the video are there too. So usually all of our tutorial material is available on the website if you want to go there and check it out. Uh, but today we'll just be going over an introduction to what uh, the Supercomputing Institute is, uh, what we do, and how you can use our services. So uh, we're the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute. Uh, we're located here in Walter Library. Most of our consultants are here on the fifth floor. Uh, most of our staff uh, is here on the fifth floor. And then the machines are down in the basement below. So. Uh, our mission is to provide advanced research computing infrastructure and expertise to the University of Minnesota and to the research scholarly community in the state of Minnesota in order to advance and accelerate research, foster innovation and discoveries through advanced computing technologies, scientific computing in informatics, application development and services. Basically, um, if you have a computational problem and you think that uh, you could benefit from either our, our staff's help or our uh, hardware resources, you can come to us. Um, if you're at any Minnesota educational institution and you, you can use our services um, mostly for free. So you can get quite a lot of computer time on our systems for free. Uh, you can get help for, from our staff for free up, up to a point. Um, if you need a lot of help from, uh, from the staff, like if you want one of our consultants to join your research group for a while, uh, that's also possible too. Th usually that costs something if you want them to join your research group kind of permanently for a year. But, but we have arrangements like that. So if you need help from one of our uh, consultants, uh, arrangements like that can be uh, accomplished as well. So uh, we're an academic unit, so we're kind of like a department that's focused just on this uh, scientific computing. Uh, we're under the vice president for research. Uh, we have uh, 42 full-time employees and uh, six students. And uh, we serve uh, about 800 different research groups with a principal investigator, and we have about 40 more than 4,600 uh, active users, so users that are, are logging in regularly. So we, we support our quite a ri wide variety of people. Most of our users are here at the University of Minnesota, but we have a quite a number at different educational institutions in the state of Minnesota and, and uh, some at other organizations in the state of Minnesota as well. So here's kind of the, the uh, governing structure. So there's uh, research computing, which is a collection of uh, departments or, or of these uh, yeah, re uh, academic departments under the vice president for research. MSI, Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, this is us. Also in research computing, there's an informatics institute. They do like um, a gen genome analysis and, and things like that, biological calculations. And there's a U-spatial, they do a spatial computing, uh, different types of uh, geospatial uh, work. Uh, so MSI, that's, that's us. Uh, we are composed of these five different staff groups then. Uh, there's the user gateway group. Uh, that's the group that interacts with users most directly. They kind of handle the communications between the users and, uh, and uh, outreach events. Uh, scientific Computing Solutions, that's the group I'm in. So we're a set of staff that's mo uh, composed of uh, consultants. So what we do is we, we uh, help different research groups to use the, the supercomputers or to get going on the systems or if, they're, if their simulations are crashing, we help them to solve their problems. And sometimes we work long term on a project with a research group uh, as kind of a consulting scientist. Uh, we also help with uh, different 
sorts of system improvements. So, so uh, some occasionally, every few years, we get a new supercomputer. We'll help set that up and make sure it's running fast, uh, benchmarking and things like that. So that's the Scientific Computing Solutions Group. We have a research uh, informatics solutions group. So the, these uh, staff members, they do uh, bioinformatics. They help uh, bi uh, biological researchers to use the computers to, to run their uh, pipelines. Uh, they do different kinds of life science computing and different sorts of informatics research. So that's uh, uh, another group uh, on in our uh, organization. We have an application development group. Uh, so this group, they do software development for different uh, applications that uh, usually that researchers want. So some there was a group that wa had um, uh, computations, uh, material science computations, and they, w they had these visualizations and they wanted to make them available on a website. So we helped them code a website where they could uh, put up these visualizations and people could look at them and spin them around and, and check them out. So if you need some custom software written, uh, you can contact us and, and uh, we have some staff that might be able to help you, help you with that. Uh, they also do some, some kind of internal programming as well. Uh, and then we have some uh, uh, the advanced systems operations group. So these are the system administrators mostly. They keep the systems running. They make sure they're running well and quickly. Uh, they do the kind of maintenance on the systems and uh, make sure everything is, is working well for, for all of our researchers. So these are the, the five groups that we have in MSI. Uh, here's an overview of who, who is in each of the groups, uh, what kind of staff members we have. So S SES, Scientific Computing Solutions, that's the group I'm in. So uh, these are the, we're mostly scientists that were doing some kind of simulations on supercomputers in the past. And so we were hired here to help other people uh, do simulations and get their uh, uh, workflows accomplished. Here's the, the research informatics group, research informatics solutions. So these are mostly folks doing uh, bioinformatics and they're mostly uh, biologists of different kinds. Uh, so biological scientists working, working in that domain. There's the application development solutions. Uh, these folks are doing the programming, so they make custom software. Uh, the here's the user gateway group. They do handle uh, mostly the user communications, uh, so they're kind of the first line of, of defense for communications. Uh, if you have a if you have a question and you email help at MSI, they'll be the the first level that responds. And then depending on the complication of uh, the complication of the problem, it might go up to one of these other groups to help you further. And then advanced systems operations, these are the, the folks that keep the systems running, the system administrators mostly. And so uh, that's that group down there. So there's an overview of how our staff are, are distributed. So a revision to foster innovation and discovery through advanced research and computing. So we're really here to try to help people to uh, solve their scientific questions as efficiently as possible. And, uh, and uh, to use our computing resources to help you solve your scientific questions as efficiently as possible. So here's, here's kind of an overview of, of what uh, groups use our systems and what domains they come from. So we have really a wide variety of users from a wide variety of, a variety of different domains. You can see health sciences, genetics, engineering, biology. The um, biology and health sciences slices are actually quite large now and that's kind of a newer development. It, it was um, more dominated by engineering and, and chemistry, physics, maybe 10, 15 years ago. But, but recently now, uh, we have a lot of biology users as well. And you see we have kind of uh, almost almost a slice from, from every sort of department. Social sciences is, is a smaller slice, but, but most of the other sort of scientific departments we have a pretty sizable slice from. Um, here's uh, allocated service units by discipline. So this is uh, basically CPU time. So a service unit one service unit corresponds to one and a half hours of computation on a single processor core. So this is a breakdown about of who's using the, the uh, CPUs, the compute units. So uh, here you can see chemistry uses quite a large chunk and engineering uses quite a large chunk. Here's physics and math, biology is using a, an ever larger chunk. So it's distributed uh, in this fashion. Uh, this, you can see, is, is a little bit different than this. So, so th we have a lot of users from different groups, but they use sort of the compute uh, in different amounts. And so diff some people want a lot of compute. Some people want a lot of storage. Like they don't need as much compute, but they need to store a lot of data. Some people have uh, all different sorts of needs. So this is a, just a breakdown of who's using the compute. 
here's a breakdown of the storage uh, by discipline. So here you can see chemistry is actually not, it was using quite a lot of compute. It's using quite a lot less storage. It, they don't need as much storage space. But the genetics folks, they need a lot of storage in biology. If you're storing a, like a genome or a portion of a genome, that tends to be quite a lot of data. So these, these folks use quite a lot of storage. So this is a kind of an interesting comparison of what the different groups, domains need. Okay, so uh, our location. So this, our main location is here in Walter Library, uh, staff on the fifth floor and machines in the basement. Uh, but we also have five uh, labs at different locations. Uh, this is the Scientific Development and Visualization Laboratory right here. This is our, our main lab, probably. But we have four other labs on, in different places on campus and one over in uh, St. Paul, the Computational Genetics Laboratory. So these are just places where you can come and you can use a workstation computer. Um, uh, you can use a lot of the software that we have. So if you're, if you're here, then you can use our software licenses on these computers. Uh, it's a little bit easier to connect to the supercomputer from, from these computers if you're in the lab, although you can do that from your laptop as well. So, but sometimes peop people find it convenient to actually come to a workstation and use a workstation for a while. And sometimes we give tutorials in the, in the labs. Uh, this is probably the prime location for tutorials, so this is the one that's used most for that, but sometimes the other ones are used as well. Uh, yep, so this is just an overview of what's in the labs. Workstations. Uh, oh, this this is actually on the ground floor of Walter Library. We have a, a visualization screen down there, so it's like a power wall where you can do these big visualizations. So uh, some there's some classes that actually meet there. There's an astrophysics class, and they do like big he likes to do big pictures of stars and, and things like that. So they use that as their meeting area for the class, so they can do these really big uh, images down down there in the in the LMDL with the with the large screen. Uh, but if you can. Uh, use that room temporarily, like if you have a presentation, you want to make a really large visualization on screen, you can go down and, and uh, book, book that room for, for temporary use. Uh, we have a couple, these, uh, are, these labs are in a couple different buildings here on, on campus, and, and uh, we, yeah, so you can use our machines in those labs as well. Uh, so any questions so far about the locations or just the overview? Okay, so um, our resources, like uh, the actual hardware and, and uh, the services that we provide. So you can kind of divide it up into these four categories. Uh, so one is the batch HPC. HPC stands for high performance computing. So that's the supercomputer down in the basement. So the supercomputer is made of, um, you can think of it as made of a bunch of regular computers, kind of like th these here, except they're shrunk down and they're racked up in these black refrigerator racks. So uh, like our newer computer, Masabi, I believe, has something like 700 some nodes. Each node has 24 cores. So you can think of e one, each single node as being basically a, like a pretty good desktop machine. Like if you went to Best Buy and you bought a quite like a good desktop machine, that's kind of what one node is, if that makes sense. So you can think of it as Masabi, our super newer supercomputers, being like seven, seven, eight hundred of those shrunk down, uh, racked up in these refrigerator racks. So what you can do is if you want, if you need compute, if you need to use uh, processors to compute something, you can connect to Masabi, our supercomputer, and you can request a certain number of nodes or for a cer certain amount of time. And then uh, you'll wait for your turn. Uh, the, the supercomputer is controlled by a queuing system. And when it's your turn, then you'll be, you'll be given those nodes and you can use them for a while to perform any calculations that you're interested in. So that's kind of, I'd say, the, the biggest hardware resource that we have at MSI is the, is the supercomputers down in the basement that provide this batch high-performance computing service. Uh, we also have uh, interactive uh, high-performance computing. So this is, um, we have a set of systems that uh, you can access more quickly. So if you go to the main supercomputer, usually you have to wait your turn. You have to wait for a while to get it to start. Um, we have some systems that are more quickly accessible so that you can interact with them more easily and do things uh, more interactively, like type commands and immediately see the result. So if you're using the batch mode, you usually have to wait for your turn, and then it runs. Usually it runs without you. It runs maybe in the middle of the night, maybe in the middle of the day, whenever it can find an open space, and then it gives you a result at the end. The interactive compute, you can actually visualize things interactively and, and uh, interact with more directly. Uh, we also have web portals and databases. So this tends to be like, um, 
sometimes uh, custom software is developed for a research group. Uh, like we have a group that uh, was viewing images of animals in the um, this uh, in Africa. They had a, a research project taking lots and lots of pictures over Africa, and then they used like machine learning to try to figure out which images had animals in them. And then uh, they they'd uh, I think they did some crowdsourcing. So they had a website that would go up, and then people would look at the images, and then they'd l they'd label which ones had which kind of animals in it. So I think we I think we helped them develop that website, and then you know put up that web portal so that they could do that. So there's different kinds of um, uh, web portals databases uh, that we provide for, for people. Uh, basically, when they work with us on a research project, uh, we help them do that kind of thing. And then we provide a place for data storage. So if you just have a bunch of data and you want to store it with us, uh, you can do that. You have to request uh, how much storage you'll need, uh, and we'll go over how much storage you can get later. We have different levels of storage. We have uh, the fast storage is connected to the supercomputer. We call that the, the tier one. We have a slower storage, tier two, and then we have a even slower storage, tier three. And uh, it, um, it's cheaper to get the slower, and then it's it's harder or more expensive to get the faster. But you can get chunks of, of all kinds for free, s uh, up to a certain amount, depending on what you need. So um, I'll, we'll go over that more in the later in the, tu tu in the tutorial. So these are kind of the categories of uh, services that we provide to users. Any questions so far? Yeah, so uh, usually what happens is the tier one, so the tier one storage, the fast uh, disks are connected directly to the supercomputer, so usually it'll write the files there uh, during the compute, or that's what most people do. And then uh, if you don't want to keep them there permanently, you can move them onto the slower storage, uh, the tier two storage or the tier three storage. Um, if you're creating really a huge amount of data and it won't fit within your space on tier one storage, sometimes people within their calculation in the batch compute, sometimes they set up commands that'll automatically move it off to tier two as it's going, if that makes sense. So yeah, there's different kinds of, of um, strategies for that. Yeah. Okay, uh, so the, the machines that we have in the basement, the newest one is called Masabi. Uh, it has uh, about 16,800 uh, total cores on Haswell processors and 67 megabytes total, or terabytes of uh, total RAM. Uh, it has uh, 80 uh, K40 NVIDIA GPUs, so GPUs, graphical processing units. Um, those can be used for scientific calculations uh, if you have a, a program that knows how to take advantage of those. So if you have a program that knows how to use a GPU, it can help your program run a lot faster. Uh, so we have uh, 40 nodes, each with two, two of those NVIDIA K40 GPUs. Uh, and then uh, the peak teraflops of the system is about 675 teraflops. We have our older um, supercomputer, Itasca. It has about a little under 9,000 uh, total cores on older Nalen processors and 31 terabytes of total RAM, and then it can get a peak of about 100 teraflops. So using one of the supercomputers requires uh, service units. So service units is basically like a bank account of compute time. Uh, what happens is a, a, a PI comes to us and says they'd like to use our system and they ask for a certain number of service units. Um, and uh, I think our default allocation is 70,000 service units. So uh, a PI that is at the University of Minnesota and just wants to use our systems for general sort of research will probably just receive, would probably just receive 70,000 service units. If they wanted to use more than that, uh, then they would explain what they were going to use them for. You make a, a request. They request in a uh, at the end of the year, every year, and then the, the allocations are given for the next calendar year. But if you run out of service units uh, in the course of the, of the year, you can ask for uh, supplemental service units. Uh, you just have to, have to explain what research you're going to use them for. Um, so this is kind of how things are laid out uh, in terms of how you, how you connect to us. Um, so, okay, I'll explain this map a bit. So here's a personal computer. So this is like your laptop or your desktop at, at your private lab. Uh, you can connect to us in a few different ways. So one way is uh, you can try to connect to our, our high-performance compute. And usually the way that you do that is uh, by a SSH in a, in, a web ter in a terminal, command line terminal. That's the most common way of doing it. So a command line terminal, if uh, you're not familiar, is uh, so if you, if you have, have a Mac, 
if you go into applications utilities terminal it'll bring up this little black text box if you have a Linux machine uh, you can usually right click and say open terminal open in terminal or there's other ways to open the terminal and then uh, there's a command called SSH which stands for secure shell which lets you connect to a remote computer so the way that you connect to the supercomputer is usually you type SSH and then you type your username at login.msi.umn.edu and then it'll ask for your password so let me do okay so now I'm connected to the login machine here at MSI down in the basement so now this terminal will send commands down to the basement down uh, stairs to the login machine this still isn't uh, the supercomputer that I'm connected to this uh, this machine is the login machine that sits out in front of the other systems and then from there I can connect again to one of the other systems that I want to try to use so uh, for example if I wanted to connect to Masabi our supercomputer from here I can type SSH Masabi and then it'll ask for my password again and now I'm connected to one of the Masabi nodes so I'm, I'm down there now connected to the one of the Masabi nodes and then from here I could submit a job script which would be uh, queued and waiting for its turn to run on, on Masabi um, instead of connecting to Masabi, I could have connected to, we have a smaller cluster called Lab. Uh, it's made of um, older hardware. But um, it is a uh, high availability. So here we go. So usually the jobs on the Lab, on the lab cluster will start immediately or, or usually very quickly. It only allows you to, to calculate uh, smaller calculations, like um, I think up to 16 cores simultaneously. But it, it tends to be less used than Masabi, so usually your calculations will start quickly. And so we classify this as one of our inter interactive systems, the lab cluster. Um, so it's a good place to run smaller cal calculations quickly, um, right there on the lab cluster. So the way that you connect to, to these clusters um, is, is usually via SSH. SSH first to the login node and then SSH to one of these uh, these other um, systems to, to run your calculations uh, some of our systems are uh, accessible via web browser uh, so one cool service that we have now is a uh, Jupyter notebook so I think it's uh, what is it let me just go okay so Jupyter Notebooks, uh, there it is, notebooks.msi.umn.edu, are, um, they're basically kind of like a MATLAB notebook, except it runs Python or R, and so you can go to notebooks.msi.umn.edu, and then you can start a notebook server, and then you can run uh, like a Python or R notebook that interactively that does calculations for you in the browser. So you can see, you can make plots like with Matplotlib or other graphing libraries and see the result in the browser. And uh, you can do different things interactively in Python and R, uh, and and uh, this gets these calculations are run. I think the back end is actually on Masabi, but a, s a subset of nodes that are I think dedicated to this. So um, this is an interesting. Let's see if I can. Okay, yeah. When you when you click the start, it asks you how long you want to want to use your notebook. Oh yeah, it gives you a few choices here. You can use Masabi, or you can use the interactive cluster, which is the lab cluster I was talking about. Uh, and then you can choose for how long you want it to run. So two cores, four gigabytes, eight hours. So I'll, I'll start that quick. That'll probably start right away. So we'll see what happens. Okay, well that's going on. Okay, so that's uh, another way that you can use our systems, uh, this uh, web portal that lets you run Jupyter Hub notebooks, which is kind of a cool thing. And uh, we also have a, um, uh, a Windows Windows cluster. Uh, so it's it's not nearly as, as used as our Linux uh, machines. All of our supercomputers are running Linux. Okay, so here's my uh, Jupyter Hub uh, notebook that's opened up. I can now start a new uh, Python notebook or an R notebook. So I'm going to start a Python notebook. So it brings up this little it's, it looks a lot like a MATLAB notebook. Let's see if it comes up here. Hmm. It's taking its time. Let me try that again. Okay. 
Okay, I'm not sure it's not not spawning at the moment. Okay, and gen generally though, you can start a, a notebook there that runs Python or R. Okay, uh, so let's see, what other special systems do we have? Uh, yeah, we have a Windows system uh, that you can use with a remote desktop. We have a, oh, we have a system called Nice that lets you get lets you get a remote desktop to a. Um, oh, here it goes. Yeah. Okay. So here is like. Um, so now it should let me run. Like Python commands. It looks like it's it's just slow to get started. In any case, you can keep running Python commands. Um. Uh, we have a system called Nice. So if you Google Nice msi.umn.edu, this is a remote desktop system. So uh, it, if you go to this uh, our frequently asked questions page about Nice, it'll tell you how to download the remote desktop client and then connect connect to our remote desktop system. So this will give you a Linux a Linux machine via remote desktop. Um, so if you want to do some sort of visualization remotely, you can you can use this remote desktop client to try to do uh, remote visualization. Uh, so that's that's an option that you can uh, use uh, that for remote desktop. Uh, let's see what else do we have. Um, we have a, a few different portals designed for specific things. Uh, Galaxy.msi.umn.edu. Galaxy is a service where it's for bioinformatics. You can build a bioinformatics pipeline graphically. So you draw like little boxes of steps in your workflow, and then you connect them with arrows, and then you you work. Uh, you set up your bioinformatics pipelines using Galaxy. And then we have some other special portals that you can use, so these different web, web methods of, of accessing us. And then our, but our main compute is accessed via SSH to, from the terminal. Uh, and then there's uh, the storage. So all of, our, all of our primary systems share the tier one storage. Uh, so the same you'll sa find the same files here on your desktop if you log in as if you logged into the supercomputer with SSH as if you logged in with uh, the nice uh, remote desktop system. So your home directory is the same everywhere, so you don't have to copy files between the systems. You'll see the same home directory everywhere, and, um, and, this and mostly the same software everywhere. Uh, second tier storage then, this is on a, a, a Ceph uh, object store. So to move uh, files to second tier storage, you'd use commands from the command line, like uh, S3 command put, which would push a file and then to a, a bucket, which is what they call, it's, it's similar to a directory on second tier storage. You could push files off your home storage to your second tier storage or pull them back depending on what you want to do. Okay, so um, I've showed you a little bit of this demo already. So uh, I, connect, I connected here to, uh, this is our lab cluster uh, via the, the terminal. Uh, I could have connected to Masabi or Itasca. And then from here, if you want to run a job, uh, there's a few different ways to do it. I'll run a maker test job one. Okay, I'm going to make a tiny job script. So usually the way that you run a uh, calculation on the supercomputer is, is by making a job script, which is basically a little text file that tells it what you want to do, or the commands that you want to run. So I'm going to make... Um, Okay, so this is a very, very tiny job script. Uh, so the first line is just telling it that the rest of the job script should be read with the bash command line interpreter. Uh, if you don't know what that means, uh, don't worry. We have uh, another tutorial about job submission that goes into more detail about this. this. This line here is the resource request. This is telling it how much time I want. I'm asking for two minutes, so this is a tiny, tiny job. So it's hours, minutes, seconds, wall time. Then I'm asking for one node and one core on the node, so a very tiny. One one processor core. And I'm asking for two gigabytes of memory. So this is this is how the the system knows how much hardware I want to use and for how long. 
And then down here, just go the commands that you would normally type to run your calculation. So maybe you want to run MATLAB on some sort of input file. You'd type down there, you'd do like MATLAB and then some input file. You might, you might need to load a piece of software. I'll talk about loading software later. Uh, so here I'm doing, uh, I'm just printing the words, hello world. That's, that's all I'm doing. So this is like a extremely tiny calculation. Why isn't that working? Okay. Okay, and then the way that you submit it is you use the command qsub, q, q s u b, and then the name of the job script, and then it gives you this little response. This is the job number. Every job is given a number. I can type the command qstat, which tells me the status of my jobs. Here it's uh, this r it means it's running already, it, it which makes sense because it was such a tiny job it probably started immediately. If you have a larger job that's using more hardware, it might have to wait for its turn for so that it can find like an open set of hardware that fits your specification. So it's kind of a, the job scheduler plays this kind of complicated game of Tetris combined with standing in line. So it tries to stack it as full, the, the server as full as it possibly can by, so if, if your job will fit in a little open ho hole, it'll slide you in there right away. But you also are standing in line with the other jobs. So if your job is the same as another job, then if that job was submitted first, generally it'll run first. And actually, that's not even quite true because um, it depends on how many s how how many service units your group has, how quickly your job starts. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Okay, so it. Uh, yeah, you can if you have a like uh, this was a single core job. Most of the nodes on on uh, the lab server have sixteen cores, so if y yeah, it could stack up to sixteen single core jobs together, for multiple users. For multiple users. Yep, yep, yeah. So it'll it'll try to pack as full as it can. Yep. Uh, so here's, um, it's finished now. When, it, when it's done, it produces two files. This .o file is the output. This will just have anything that would normally have been written to the screen would, will be in that .o file. So here it's, it has the word, hello world. So normally that, my, my calculation would have just printed those words, but since it ran as a job without me connected to it, it, it saves the output in that .o file so I can come back and look at it later. And uh, whoops. And then the .e file just collects any error messages that might have um, been printed. Uh, and there's none because it, it uh, didn't have any errors. So these are the two files that are printed at the end of the job when it's finished. Uh, otherwise, if your job, if your calculation would create any other files, those will be created just as normal. Um, so if you know, you're going to create a bunch of data somewhere, it'll, it'll be created as it runs. The O file just collects anything that would have been printed to the screen and saves it in the .o file. Okay, so that's kind of a little sample of how, uh, how you submit a job to the, the scheduler. And it works the same on, on all of our clusters, Masabi, Itasca, and Lab. You connect with SSH, make a job script, and then you submit it, and it waits for its turn to run. Uh, we have another tutorial that's just about job submission and, um, and uh, ways of managing that. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, I'd suggest that tutorial. We have the slides and videos up on the website, too, so you can learn, learn a lot more about that. So, uh, yeah, you submit with QSub. You check the status with QSTAT. And now if I do QSTAT, it'll just say, now it shows the job, and it says C, which means complete. And then that'll disappear after a while. If I wanted to delete the job, I could do QDEL, QDEL, and then the job number. The job number is that number that it printed right after I ran the q sub command if i did q del and then i did like uh, that job number so like eight one nine three oops three nine one I, and if i typed that it would have killed the job or it would have removed it from the queue if it wasn't running yet so q del will cancel the job and then yeah the job output are those output files that it makes okay any questions so far about that so that's the that's the main way that people usually run um, jobs on the on the um, supercomputer. Okay. S yep. Yeah, that'll be in the tutorial. I'll tell you a little bit right now, actually, because that's a good topic. Uh, so yeah, that the job submission tutorial will tell you more about loading software, but I can tell you a little bit right now as well. So uh, we have software available my, um, via modules. So if you type uh, module avail. It'll show you all the available software modules, and it's a huge list. So there's this huge 
uh, list. I'm going to hit Q to cancel that. Okay, of software. If you want to see all of the available software of a particular type, you could type module avail and then the beginning of the software name. So if I, I'm going to type module avail MATLAB, so this will this will show me just the the versions of MATLAB that we have available. So we tend to keep a lot of versions of things. So sometimes researchers use like MATLAB 2013 for a, like a paper, and then they need to do more, and they need like that version specifically again. So we tend to keep things around for a while. Um, but although we are trying to clean up a little more rapidly now, but we do have a lot of versions of things. So if you want to use that version of MATLAB in particular, you can load it by name. So you can type module load MATLAB, and then you do slash R, and I'll do 2013B. Okay. Now if I typed MATLAB, it would la launch that version of MATLAB. I'm not going to do it because it'll get, it'll get hung up in the opening sequence, and then I'll have to kill it. So if I type, I'm just going to type which MATLAB, that'll show me it that's when I type which MATLAB, that's saying if I were to type MATLAB, which one would it run? And then it'll show me it, it would run this one. It'll, it, it's, it would run that MATLAB right there. If I unload the module, if I do module unload MATLAB, now if I type which MATLAB, it doesn't, it just says there's no MATLAB. It doesn't know which one to run. So you have to load usually the piece of software that you want to run, uh, and then, then it'll know where to find it when you run the command. Yeah, so that kind of makes sense. Yeah, so we have quite a lot of software available. Uh, so if you want to see like R, module avail R. So here's the versions of R that we have available. If you want to see, um, let's see, module avail, what do we have? Gaussian, that's a popular one for simulating atoms. Uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of different software available. If you want to, you, could, you can just type module avail, see the full list, and then scroll through the full list if you're curious if we have something available. Yep. Yeah, so um, it depends on how many people are interested in it. So you can install software in your own directory if you want to, because uh, you, you own your own directory, so you can install whatever you want there. Um, but if you want, if you think like multiple groups of people want to use it, you can put in a request for us to install it, and then we'll uh, our software manager will have a look at it, and if it seems reasonable, then they might. Yep, often they say yes because we have so much software installed. So. Okay, so that's um that's kind of a, a quick overview of how to load software. Um, okay, interactive HPC. Uh, does anyone have any questions about those soft software modules? Good. Okay, that's good. Um, okay, interactive HPC. So interactive, you can also use our systems interactively. Um, and uh, right now I'm connected to the lab cluster. That's a, a, a high, high availabil avail availability cluster because it's less used than Masabi. So jobs here tend to start really quickly. So if I want to use, an, uh, say, a few cores interactively, I can actually type a different command. I can type Q sub um, minus I, capital I, and then minus L, and now wall time equals, I'm going to ask for five minutes. I'm going to do nodes equals one, processor per node equals, I'll ask for two cores, and I'll do mem equals, I'll do four gigabytes. Okay, then I hit enter, and now what happens is the cursor appears to hang, but what it's doing is it's putting that job request into the queue, like all the other jobs, and it's waiting for its turn to start. When it starts now, it gives me back the cursor, and now I'm connected, you can see I'm connected to a different node, now I'm connected to one of the compute nodes, now I can type any commands I want to on the keyboard, and it will run them right away. So I can use this these two cores interactively for the next five minutes. Uh, I kind of own those two cores for the next five minutes. So all of our systems let you run like this if you want to. Q sub minus capital I stands for interactive, and then you do minus L, and then you do the resource request, which is wall time nodes, cores per node, and memory. And then it waits for its turn to run. Uh, it, it be they tend to start really quickly on the lab cluster because the lab cluster is a smaller cluster that's much more available. So you can usually run small, uh, up to 16 core jobs pretty quickly in the lab cluster. You can do it on Masabi too, though, if you want. You can even ask for like 20 nodes. The problem is if you do that, if you try to run an interactive job like that in Masabi, it's going to wait for probably some hours before it starts, or maybe a day. You know, if you were running a 20 node, 20 node job, and people don't like to wait with the cursor hanging there and not knowing when it's going to start. So usually for the large jobs, they try to collect them into job scripts so that it can run without you. But you can run interactively if you want to. So it's always another option. To close a job like this, you can just type exit and then it closes that job. Yeah. 
Um, another form of interactive computing that I talked about uh, is uh, that remote desktop system called NICE. So um, you, you download a remote desktop client to your home computer, to your notebook, and then you can use that to connect to our NICE server. And that will give you, uh, it'll open up a, uh, a desktop that looks just like the desktops that you get if you logged in here, here in uh, the lab. So then you have like a, a Linux environment you can use. Uh, I think there's a menu of choices. You can ask for like four or eight cores, I think. And then you have that for a few hours. It'll tell you how long you have that for so that you can run interactively with remote desktop. We have a Windows system. You can uh, connect to us uh, if, you're, if you're interested in that. Um, you can ask me afterwards, or you can Google Windows at MSI, UMN. Uh, and then we have the Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which I showed you briefly, where you can open those notebooks in the browser and run Python and R code. So those are the different environments for running interactive jobs. This I sub, that's the Q sub minus I thing that I was just, show just showing you, the Q sub minus I. Sometimes we call that I sub. There's another command called I sub that does the same thing. But a Q sub minus I is actually a, a better way to do it. This is a photo of Jupiter Hub. This is, I think, is Galaxy. Yeah, this is Galaxy, where they're drawing a bioinformatics workflow here to try to set it up. Uh, Galaxy. Yep, interactive jobs, uh, remote desktop, GUI software, notebook, Galaxy. Okay, so that's interactive, interactive, the different options for interactive computation. Or there's the labs. You can actually come to the lab and get a physical desktop if you want to. Okay, um, a little bit about storage. So our tier one primary storage is about six petabytes. It's pretty fast. You can do 40 gig, 48 gigs read-write per second, and it's mounted on all of our resources, so you see the same home directory everywhere. So your home directory is on this tier one storage, high-performance storage. We also have the tier two storage, um, three petabytes of that. Uh, you move files using uh, Amazon's S3 command interface. So you do S3 command put, S3 command pull, and uh, or get. And, and then uh, it's available uh, from the command line on our systems, but you can also access it. Um, there's a way to access it in the browser uh, from other places and in in not just on campus, you can access it as well. And then we have a tape storage, tier three tape storage. So um, you can, uh, what you can do is you can buy a tape, a magnetic tape from, uh, uh, from us, and then you can put your old data on there and it ends up being a cheap way to store data for long term. The downside is it's just slower to get get the data off. Um, so I think if you, uh, uh, you can still access it via uh, like a web interface, but I, I the tape robot has to actually go get the tape and plug it into the thing and then read it off the tape. So it's just, it won't, it's a little bit slower to get it back if you need, maybe it'll take some hours or depending on how much you um, have on the tape. But it's a good place for cold, cold data. So these are kind of some options about storing regarding storage of data at the university. So there's MSI, Tenasis, that's our high performance storage, and then tier two Ceph, and then we have the tier three storage. Uh, OIT, that's Office of Information Technology. They run some data storage services as well, like Google Drive. They have a, search call, a service called Isilon, and they have another block storage service. Different departments, like the physics department has some data storage, the other departments have data storage. The library has some data storage as well. And then a lot of researchers just store data on their workstations. So there's a lot of data storage choices at the U. Um, uh, we're one of the uh, one of the options uh, that you can consider, uh, but these other you know options also exist, and so you might need to explore what's most convenient for your particular workflow. Here's kind of a menu of comparison. So like MSI, the high performance storage is good for big data, and it's and it's fast. Tier two is also good for big data, but it's not not as fast. But you c it's easier to share access. You, uh, you access it with a key, which is like a string of numbers and letters. If you give someone that key, then they can access your data on tier two storage, and sometimes people like to share it that way. Um, uh, archival storage, it's, it's decent for archival storage. Uh, you can access it uh, in a lot of places. Uh, different departments have different kinds of storage. Uh, here's some, some of the options from OIT. Um, and Google Drive. Google Drive is actually a decent place for some kinds of data. Um, they, the university has that infinite Google Drive storage, and Google seems to not complain uh, if you put a lot up there. So uh, some researchers end up putting a lot up in the Google Drive um, if, if that's convenient for you. 
Um, it does throttle you every day. I can't remember where the limit is. It's like 700 gigs of upload or something uh, per day, and then, and then it then it cuts you off till the next day. But it's it's yeah. Okay. Um, one way that you can move data that's uh, somewhat convenient is called Globus. So Globus is a file transfer system that the university pays a license for. So you can access it if you go to globus.org. Go to globus.org, and then you click Login. And then uh, you select what university you're associated with. So you can select the University of Minnesota from this drop-down, then you continue. And then it's going to... Okay, it normally asks for your, your username and password. But then once you're logged in, uh, you can, w it has these two panes, and what you can do is you can select two Globus endpoints. A Globus endpoint is basically a machine that will move data for you. So here at MSI, we have, we have uh, some Globus endpoints. So we have UMN MSI uh, Home. That's our, that's our primary tier one storage. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to select that one. And then I'm going to log in. Okay, so this will be my home directory here uh, at MSI. So I can see it in this pane right there. Now I'm actually going to look at our uh, tier two storage. I'm going to do UMN MSI pound tier two. So we have a Globus endpoint on the tier two storage as well. So I'm going to log into that one. Okay, so here on the left, I have I have my primary storage, tier one storage, my home directory, and here on the right, I have my tier two storage. So I can move, this is a one gigabyte dummy file. I'm gonna select that, and I'm gonna put it into my bucket right here. And now I'm gonna, what you do is you do, uh, click this little blue button right there. So now it started that transfer. So now I can look at the transfer here. It'll tell me how it's going. The transfer started at one gig is pretty small actually, so it's gonna finish pretty soon. It'll have some lag on getting running. Now it's done. Yeah, so it moved, it moved, you know, pretty quickly. It took like uh, 30, 36 megs a second, and it transferred. It said it was only 500 gigs, 500 megs. I thought it was a gig file. Anyway, it, it moved from from my home directory to tier one storage, tier two storage. So if uh, it's a convenient web interface to move um, files uh, between different Globus endpoints. The only trick is that a uh, Wherever you're moving to or from has to be running a Globus endpoint. They have to have that software installed on a system so that you can move. If you want to move uh, files to your laptop uh, or your desktop, you can download the Globus client and, and start it running on your laptop, your private uh, computer. You choose a name for it then, and then you'll be able to search for it in this file manager. And then you can use this to move back and forth with this web interface. So uh, people find this convenient sometimes. It also has some nice uh, retry features. So sometimes if you lose your connection, your, your uh, transfer stops. Globus kind of is good at figuring out where to pick up again so you don't have to repeat the whole thing and it'll keep it going. Uh, so it's a good good way to do large transfers. And if you're transferring between on-campus Globus endpoints, like um, between like here and physics or somewhere else like that, it'll be it'll tend to be faster because we've put our Globus endpoints on, on, a, on the fast network so it'll move quick more quickly. If you're going to your laptop, it might not be particularly quick quickly because then it depends on how your laptop is connected. But if you're going between like departments on campus, it'll tend to go quickly. Or, or between on campus and like a, like a somewhere that's connected to us by internet too, like a national lab, like uh, Argonne, or if you're moving data from Chicago to here, uh, it, it'll go quickly too. Uh, there is a Google Drive endpoint. Um, yes, yeah, so this is actually experimental. Um, so yeah, I would. It's in a beta mode, so it's it it may break more frequently. UMN MSI. Oh no. Yes. Okay. The way that it works is is an unusual method. You have to go to endpoints, and you have to search all endpoints, and then you have to do UMN MSI pound G drive. Let's see. Okay. There it is. And you say UMN MSI G drive. You have to do collections. Then you add a collection. This will take you into a dialogue where you um, type in your UMN username and uh, you choose a name for your G drive co collection. And then after you've done that, it, you, that you can in, in the file transfer, okay, I'll just, I'll just do it quick. Uh, so it's gonna take you through this dialogue, tell you, ask you what university you're at. 
you have to give it permissions to ac access your Google identity so that it, it knows how to do it. Okay, now I'm going to do um, giga, and that's my username, and then at umn.edu, and then no. Oh, I'm logged in as the wrong person. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to not, not do it because it, I'm logged in as the wrong person here. Um, any, in any ways, right after I say continue, then I choose a name for it. And after I've chosen a name, uh, then what happens is when I go back to um, the file manager, I, I can type that name in right here, and it'll appear, and then you'll be able to see your Google Drive files. Uh, so yeah, we do have that. It's it's a experimental service, though, so it, it it is broken before, just so you know. But but that's available. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense, Globus? Um, there's actually also a command line m way to to use Globus if if you want to. Uh, we have some information about that on our website, and and on Globus's website, it's available too. So that's another option. Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, yep, so you can it. Um, okay. I'll tell you a couple more things about the way the storage is set up. Okay, so every um, every group has a storage quota. And to see how much of it you're using, you can type the command group quota if you're logged into the terminal on one of our systems. Also, if you log into your account on our website, it should give you a summary of this as well. So if you type group quota, this gives you, it tells, tells us, uh, tells me I'm using 60% of, uh, or our group is using 60% of our quota, and this is our file quota. There's a file quota as well as a, a data quota. Um, th so this is on primary storage, your home directory. Uh, also accessible on um, the Linux systems is a Scratch directory. So we have one called Scratch Global. Uh, this is a petabyte of storage that's open to anyone to use to store temporary files. You can make a directory there. You can put information there and store uh, files there for a while. I believe if the files are not uh, updated for three weeks, or is it two weeks? Two weeks, I think. Uh, they're auto deleted, so you have uh, it's temporary storage. You can't keep data there permanently, but it's otherwise it's free, so you can you can uh, use use this for temporary storage. Scratch Global is sometimes slow because it can be heavily used, where people put temporary files there and then do more data processing and clean them up and then put the result in their home directory. So it can it can be slow, but uh, Scratch Global is is available on all of our Linux machines. So you see the same Scratch Global on the desktop as, in, as on the supercomputer as on all the other systems. You'll see the same Scratch Global. There's also a Scratch Local. Uh, if you do CD Scratch Local. Uh, there's a local scratch. This is different on every system. Uh, it tends to be faster because it's not as heavily used by everyone, uh, but it but it's different on every system. So like that desktop has a different scratch local than a, a than a node in the basement, and every node on a on a in the supercomputer has a different scratch local. So you won't see the same files if you're on a different one. So if you write something temporary in scratch local, you'll want to copy it off probably to save it for long term. Okay, so those scratch options are also available for temporary files. Uh, just be careful if you leave data there for, for too long, it'll be auto-deleted if you don't update it, if you don't move it off. Okay, uh, we also have, uh, it's possible to um, share data with other people. Every group has a public and a shared directory. If you go up one level from your home directory, you'll end up in your group directory. There's a, there's a, there's a directory there called um, shared. So this tends to be the place where people put their shared files. Uh, you actually don't have to use this if you don't want to, but it tends to be the place th that people put their shared files. And then there's a few different ways to share data. You can run, you can soften the Linux permissions if you want to, uh, just so that other people can access them. Or, and that's usually used to share with your group members. Um, or there's, uh, you can also access, access these uh, shared directories using Globus. And uh, there's a way to share files using Globus w with another Globus user. So you can select a directory in Globus, you can right click and say share, and then you can type in the name of another Globus user and it, it will send them a link in an email and then they can follow that link and then you can share data with them that way. So it's, a, it's, a, it's another way to, to share data. So this is a recap of the computing and storage uh, assets. 
So there's the high performance computing, the supercomputers, uh, there's uh, portals and databases, and then there's interactive computing. Uh, and then for data storage, we have the primary storage, six petabytes, we have the second tier storage, three petabytes, and then we have the tape, tape library, which um, you purchase a, a tape from us and then you have it for a certain amount of time. Uh, the interactive computing, there's a lot of different me methods. Uh, the nice client, the running jobs interactively th from the command line. Uh, we have a uh, Windows server as well, and uh, things like JupyterHub notebooks. Uh, yeah, okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Software, I kind of, I kind of um, gave a, a summary already about how to load software. Uh, most of our software is free for all of our users to use. There are some special pieces of software that are controlled by a license that you have to request it being added to the license. If you run into a piece of software like that, you just send us an email, uh, help at msi.umn.edu, and we'll tell you if we're able to add you to the license. Sometimes you have to pay something, or sometimes you have to do something else, like sign up a, li a license agreement form or something. But most of our software is free for everyone to use. Uh, user services, uh, we have a help desk, it's just out by the door here. Uh, it's usually staffed by a student during work hours, so um, if you come here, they will help you. You can get help in person. Otherwise, if you email help at msi.umn.edu, um, your ticket will be placed into a help queue and we'll try to route you to the person that might be able to best help you. So it could be, could be our students, if it's uh, like a simpler question, like a login question or, or something simpler with software, or it could be a consultant if you have like a project that you need help with. Um, tutorials and workshops, we have tutorials and workshops all the time. Uh, on our website, you can see when they're scheduled and then you can come and visit. Sometimes we have longer classes, like day-long classes uh, on a certain topic, like a programming topic or, or uh, different topics. Uh, we can help you with code development. Uh, we have programmers here that can help you develop uh, custom code if you need it, or maybe get your code just to work on our systems. Maybe you're coming from another compute center and you need help to make it work here. Uh, or if you just need your code to run faster, we can help you get it to run faster. Or uh, data visualization, so there's a lot of ways to do that, but uh, one, one cool way is we have a visualization wall down on the first floor that you can use if you book time there. And consulting services, here's our staff. Uh, 24 of our staff are able to consult so they can actually join your research group for a while and work with you and um, help you accomplish your goals. Uh, I think there's some time limits on how long they can do that for free. It's some, somewhere like a month. They can help you part-time for free. And then beyond that, then you could arrange to purchase some of their time if you want a longer uh, amount of help. But you can get quite a lot of help for free. So if you need help, I'd recommend just sending us an email. Uh, collaboration and projects. We have a lot of ongoing projects uh, that we collaborate with uh, users on. Uh, sometimes we're a part of a grant, like a, user ha a researcher has an idea to build like a system to... We have one that's uh, building a system for agricultural researcher re researchers to try to analyze their agricultural data, and there's been a lot of grant proposals around that, and we're part of that process, uh, participating in that. So we can be part of, a, like, support a, a grant application for a project. Um, most of our services are free, uh, or at least up to a point, but it, you can get quite a lot of service for free, uh, both in consulting time and in just computer time or hardware time. Uh, but um, there are here. This kind of shows you fees. If you have, if you need custom software development, that is is something that uh, it, there's always a fee for up front. Or um, if you you want us to like run your website on a long term basis or something like that. So this kind of gives a uh, an overview of what things might have a fee. Or if you're like an external company, we still can in interact with an external company, but um, usually there's some fee involved with that and some agreement has to be set up. Uh, every group has a PI, and that's the person that who's ultimately in control. And then users uh, at the university can be added by the PI to their group, and then they can use the service units that the PI acquires. And uh, uh, the PI can designate one of his users, or one, or one of his or her users, as an administrator. And then uh, that administrator has some additional privileges that they can uh, request more service units and uh, do different things with permissions. So they can. They can help so the PI doesn't have to always manage uh, everything about the group. Uh, PI eligibility, faculty members are eligible, uh, academic professionals at the University of Minnesota. So these are some people that have titles like researcher or other kinds of uh, similar titles. Uh, as long as they're approved by the department, they can also be a PI. 
or uh, faculty at any other educational institution, post-secondary institution at the I in the state of Minnesota that is eligible to be a PI in our system. Uh, MSI accounts are renewed annually, so it's a calendar year. Uh, renewals begin in October, uh, where groups will begin to request the service units that they will want for the following year or the storage that they'll want for the following year. Then it'll be uh, considered and approved, I think, usually in December, and then the, the new allocation begins for the next year. Yep. You can ask for additional um, service units or storage uh, during the year, and, and a lot of groups end up doing that. Um, but the, the allocations committee meets four times a year. Uh, if, you're out, if your increase request is very small, it doesn't even have to go to that committee. It could just be approved right away usually, but if it's a, like a medium request, then it'll have to wait for the allocations committee. Uh, access, um, if you go to msi.umn.edu access and sign up, you can sign up for access to MSI. If you're already a user, if you go to msi.umn.edu my MSI, you can log in and you can see like your, your storage quota in your service units remaining. Uh, for accessing our physical labs, uh, if you visit the reception desk, they can add your U card to the system and then once you're added, then you can always come here, I think 24 hours a day and you, you can swipe through the door and you can come use the computer lab whenever you want to. And then our, the main way to contact us for help is, is um, help at msi.umn.edu. You can call this phone number as well, but um, help at msi.umn.edu is probably the best way. Okay, any questions about access so far? Um, service units, I, I mentioned this briefly, but so uh, uh, the default allocation is 70,000 service units, and uh, that's what a PI will get just by being approved to use the system. They'll get 70,000 service units. You can um, request between 70,000 and 280,000, um, but the PI will need to write a research description of what they um, intend to do, and then some MSI staff will review that and see if it seems reasonable, and then it'll be approved or adjusted, and, and uh, then they'll receive a response. If you're asking for more than 280,000, then it needs to go to the, the allocations committee, and that meets so uh, annually and then four times a year for supplemental requests. So this will be the kind of the thresholds for different amounts of service units. Um, data storage and allocation. Um, so 150 is the default. Uh, it's a small smallest default. Um, so there's no review for that. You can just uh, receive it. 150 to 5 terabytes uh, is reviewed by MSI, and you'll have to write a little description of what you intend to use it for. Between 5 and 20 terabytes, uh, you'll need to provide this additional information, justification, how much is needed, how much will be used, and how long it'll be stored at MSI. And that's, that's uh, reviewed by MSI uh, in more detail. Okay, and then these are some web pages that are useful. Our home web page, summary of software, Password reset tutorials and uh, frequently asked questions. Okay, so that's uh, basically what I uh, wanted to say today about uh, introducing MSI. I'll be hanging out afterwards. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, but if uh, you're interested in using MSI, I'd suggest just sending us an email to get started. Uh, we can really often help you quite a lot for free, um, and or help your research groups quite a lot for free. So I'd just give us a call and we'll do our best.